Okay, thank you, Dunia, and thank you for hosting us. I would also like to thank Beam, who is sponsoring uh, a part of the event. And I'm going to be talking about uh, anonymous payments in the Lightning Network. I work for Async, which is a comp one of the three companies implementing the Lightning Network uh, for Bitcoin. It's not going to be about uh, ZKP in the Prover ver Verifier ZK Snark sense. There's no ZKP yet in Bitcoin and in uh, Lightning. It's more going to be about uh, anonymous transactions, uh, a bit of onion encryption, and uh, anonymity uh, in the large. And yeah, maybe one day we'll have ZKP in, uh, in Bitcoin, but that's not for today yet. But there's going to be interesting stuff coming uh, still. So first of all, what, what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin, uh, who doesn't know Bitcoin or who... Bitcoin is magic money, it's internet money, it's magic, it's great. So, and a lot of people don't know that much about Bitcoin, know the high level things, but in fact, when, once you start digging into the details, there are a lot of interesting and subtle uh, elements uh, in the protocol and in uh, how it works. So basically it's a blockchain. I think everyone knows what a blockchain is. And what you trade are UTXOs and uh, you spend, in fact, you always, co it's very different from Ethereum. Ethereum has a balance uh, model where everyone has a balance. You have that amount of money in your account and when you transfer, you, you subtract that amount and you add it to the other guy's account. In Bitcoin, it's different. It's more like change money, where when you pay $10 for something that costs eight, you get back $2 that you can spend in another transaction, and that's how Bitcoin works. And many people think that Bitcoin is just about paying to another guy's public key, saying I'm giving those UTXOs to that private key, and if someone is able to produce a signature with that key, he gets the UTXOs. Whereas in fact, it's a, it's a lot better than that. Bitcoin has a whole scripting environment and Bitcoin can have smart contracts and they are useful for Lightning. So, for example, when you have a transaction, it takes some inputs and it produces some outputs. And when you want to produce, every output has a script attached to it. And if you want to be able to consume that output as an input, you need to give that output is just a stack script and you need to produce the inputs to that script that will evaluate to one. So that means you can do a lot of things. The, the simplest one is just produce a signature that is done by this public key and that is valid. And that's what we call pay to public key, public key hash that you see on, a, on the left, uh, top left corner where we, we just hash, hash a public key and uh, we check a signature. But you can do a lot, uh, a lot of other things like checking multi-signatures. You can also check that delays are respected. There are two opcodes on the right that are called uh, check sequence verify and check lock time verify that allow you to create a global lock. For example, saying I don't want this output to be spent before block number something and it cannot be spent before that block. Or you can also create a relative lock saying, I don't want this output to be spent before X amount of time after it was be before it was created. So it's the combination of those two with uh, powerful Bitcoin scripts that enable the Lightning Network. And there are a lot of very cool, uh, I don't know if you've heard of uh, SegWit, page script hash, a lot of cool things that are going to be helping uh, anonymity in the Bitcoin network because here you, Basically, in your output, if your output says, I'm paying that output to that public key, everyone knows who you're paying to. You're revealing a lot. But instead, what you can already do in Bitcoin is that the output is going to be just a hash, and you are paying it to someone who can produce the script that hashes to that, and then satisfy that, that script. So that allows you to hide who you're paying for until it's paid. But once it's paid, the guy who spends it has to reveal that script, so he re reveals a lot. But there's something coming to Bitcoin which is called Taproot, once Schnorr signature arrive, that will un allow you to only reveal part of your script. So there's, there's, there are a lot of very interesting anonymity stuff that are coming to Bitcoin scripts in the hopefully the next stuff fork. But I won't talk about that for this talk, maybe for another one because it's a really interesting topic with a lot of cryptography. But for thi this talk, I'm going to talk about scalability and how we achieve scalable anonymous payments in the Lightning Network. Because the main issue with Bitcoin is that it doesn't scale. 
since you need a global consensus and everyone needs to see every transaction in the network, currently, Bitcoin handles approximately seven transactions per second, which is not a lot. If you want to pay, if you want everyone to be able to pay their coffee with it, it's not a lot. And there's a rough consensus that it's not, the, the goal is not to scale it at layer one because you cannot really guarantee the same security if you try to scale with bigger blocks, for example. So that's why there's this interesting project called the Lightning Network. And the basic idea is just that you don't need to publish every transaction. Instead of publishing everything to everyone, you're just gonna publish meaningful transactions to the blockchain and do a lot of things directly peer-to-peer. -peer. So what it is, it's just a peer-to-peer -peer network of payment channels. And what's interesting is that it's really based on Bitcoin in the sense that the messages that are exchanged are Bitcoin transactions directly and valid Bitcoin transactions that could be submitted to the Bitcoin blockchain, but that, that you just keep off-chain for scalability. It's extremely cheap and uh, we'll see how it's still trustless and in a way that there are trade-offs everywhere, but it makes your payments more anonymous than Bitcoin and less susceptible to chain anal analysis if, if you do it right. And by the way, don't hesitate to interrupt if you have a question at any point instead of waiting uh, at the end when you're already lost and uh, you haven't understood the last uh, 20 slides. Just really don't hesitate. There are no dumb questions. Stop me uh, anytime when something is not uh, clear enough. So there are three main components in the Lightning Network and we'll dive into those three one at a time. The first is the concept of a payment channel. It's um, and uh, how, how it works in Lightning with uh, something called HTLCs. I'll show how it's trustless. And then I'll show how from payment channels, you can create a network of payment channels that says that if Alice can pay Bob and Bob can pay Carol, Alice can pay Carol using this network. And then I'll dive into the cryptography as aspect that is really tied to the routing algorithm and the onion packets we exchange. So a payment channel. Basically, the idea is that the way Lightning works is that you, you're going to say Alice is, wants to do payments in Bitcoin with Bob without having to make a transaction on chain all the time because it's slow, because it costs a lot of fees and everything. So Alice and Bob are going to open a channel in which they're going to be able to exchange funds instantly. The way it works is that Alice, if she is the one who wants to create the channel, is going to create a funding transaction where she says, I want to put 10 Bitcoin in that channel so that we can exchange up to 10 Bitcoins between each other. She's going to create that transaction, exchange signatures with Bob, and then she's going to publish it on the blockchain. Once that's published, Alice and Bob will be able to exchange completely off-chain by just updating the balance of this channel between, this, between themselves. I'll go into more details in the next slides in how that works, but basically the idea is that you first create a channel by creating a transaction on, on chain saying, I want to put 10 Bitcoin in a channel between Alice and Bob. Then you can do every, everything off chain and update balances saying, oh now, so at the beginning, Alice has 10 Bitcoin and Bob has only has zero Bitcoin, but then we exchange seven Bitcoins, so Alice has three Bitcoins, Bob has seven. Then you can exchange money instantly by just exchanging messages and we, without having to do anything with a Bitcoin and without submitting any transaction to Bitcoin. And once you want to close the channel because you're not going to be doing any more exchanges between Alice and Bob, then you create a transaction on chain to give the balance to people. For example, four Bitcoin to Alice and uh, six to Bob. And we'll see in detail how that works in the next slides. But the basic idea on how we can secure this and make this uh, as secure as Bitcoin without having to make a transaction is by the use of what we call hash time lock contracts. And the idea is that I'm going to pay you if you relieve a pre-image of a given hash. So, and if you don't reply to me, I'm going to get my mo money back after a delay. So the flow is that if Alice wants to buy a picture of a cat from Bob. Bob, and they both have currently a transaction that reflects the balance of the channel, six bitcoins to Alice, four bitcoins to Bob. Bob is gonna say, okay, I'm gonna give you that picture of a, of a, cha of a cat if you send me an HTLC of two bitcoin, a payment of two bitcoins. 
And in that, yeah, in that um, payment request, in fact, Bob selects a random value, a pre-image R, Bob hashes it, sends that hash to Alice, and he's going to say, use that hash to pay me two bitcoins, and when I receive the payment, I'm going to give you the pre-image. And that's what secures the, the scheme, because the Bitcoin script that is used inside it needs you to reveal the pre-image if you want to be able to spend the money on-chain. So now Alice is going to exchange signatures with Bob, saying that she had six Bitcoins and Bob had four Bitcoins. Now she has four Bitcoins, Bob has four Bitcoins, and she's offering a payment of two Bitcoins to Bob. Then Bob is going to revoke his old version of the state, saying, OK, now that you gave me that, I'm going to revoke what I had before, and I'm accepting your HTLC. And we're basically exchanging elliptic curve points. At each payment, we rotate curve points to be able to revoke all the uh, old payments. And then Bob is, go is, is going to be signing a new transaction for Alice. They keep on exchanging signatures and revocation secret. And at the end, when Bob is satisfied with the new balance, Bob reveals the pre-image. Alice can check that it matches the hash that she used for the payment. And that, in fact, allows them to spend the transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain if they needed, if they needed to. I'll have a slide. And we keep on doing that. And at the end, we have a new, everyone has a new Bitcoin transaction that could be published on chain that reflects the balance of the channel. So it's quite a complex flow because there are a lot of details to make it completely secure. And we can't explain that on slides. You have to really read the Bitcoin scripts to convince yourself that it's secure. But the overall idea is that each time you make a payment, you're going to be signing transactions with a key and you're going to be giving away the keys you used to sign the previous transaction. And that allows the other guy to catch you if you're cheating and use the revocation key that uh, the revoked uh, key that you used before. And why is it trustless? That's exactly it. If you, since people are exchanging bit signed Bitcoin transaction, nothing prevents anyone from taking an old state I don't know if I have a slide of that after. No. Nothing prevent uh, Alice, for example, to pay to Bitcoin to Bob and then say, yeah, but I had a balance that was better for me before because before I had more money. So I'm going to just publish that transaction to Bitcoin and I'm going to make it look as if I never made that payment to Bob. But because she has shared a revoke her, uh, she has revoked her previous transaction by sharing the private key that was used with that uh, transaction, in fact, in the Bitcoin script, there's a penalty transaction, there's an if branch where Bob can see that Alice is trying to cheat and can get all the money back. So if you're, cheat, if you're cheating, basically, and you are trying to broadcast on the Bitcoin blockchain a transaction that has been revoked, the other guy has to be watching the blockchain. But if he sees that transaction, he's able to get all your money and uh, to penalize you for trying to cheat. And that's exactly the visual idea of what the commitment transaction that uh, every people in the channel has. Yeah? Uh, quick question. Uh, you, you said that if you are trying to cheat, the other guy can get all your money. I thought it was updated to just get what he what you owe. Yeah. No, that, that's what we are going to do once we have We need a change to Bitcoin itself to be able to do that. There's a paper that explains that called L2, which is maybe what you read, that says uh, how we're going to achieve that once we have a new hashing uh, of code into Bitcoin. And it's been debated for years. We hope it's going to get in Bitcoin in the next soft fork, but we don't know. And until that, we, we are forced to have that penalty. And that's, that's one of the issues. Maybe it's a bit harsh, because if you cheat unintentionally, the other guy can get all the money of the channel for his side. And ideally, we'd like instead the other guy to just correct it and say, no, you, that's not the right balance. This is the right balance. And we're going to be able to do that once Bitcoin has a new uh, SIG hash no input uh, flag. But it's not there yet because it has a lot of potential drawbacks if wallets use it uh, unwisely. So it's being debated, but 
We can't do it yet. We know how to do it once uh, we have uh, that change in, Bit in Bitcoin, but not yet. And so here, you see exactly what each of the channel participants has at every time. They have a transaction that has basically all these branches. There's one output, which is the balance of A. And in that output, there's one branch that gives the money back to A after a delay. Or if the transaction has been revoked, gives the money directly to Bob. And that's why Alice shouldn't cheat, because if Alice cheats, she's going to publish that. But she has to wait for a timeout to be able to get the money. And during that timeout, Bob can just steal the money, because Alice cheated, so it's not stealing. There's an output to Bob. And for all the HTLCs, all those contracts that we exchange for payments, there are timeout and success uh, transactions. It's a bit of a detail, it's not very important, but it's exactly the same. Alice gets it after a delay, or Bob gets it if he has the revocation key. So that shows that the basic uh, mechanism that we use is when you want to get your money back without uh, agreeing with the other guy, you're going to have to wait for a delay. And during that delay, if you are broadcasting a transaction that has been revoked, the other guy can just steal the money out of that transaction. So you should not do it. So now that we have payment channels, those payment channels are just between two people if Alice wants to pay Bob. But they're not very useful if you want to have a full network and if basically everyone wants to be able to send money to everyone. So the idea is that if Alice has a channel to Bob and Bob has a channel to Carol, you want Alice to be able to pay Carol in some way. Because it wouldn't make sense to have to open a channel to everyone you want to pay. You wouldn't want to open a channel with every Starbucks you're going to, with every grocery uh, you're going to. So we're going to leverage the existing channels to create a network where you can do multiple hops when you want to pay someone. So the way it's going to work is basically exactly the same as the two people channel, but instead, the guy in the middle is just going to relay the payment. If Alice wants to pay Carol an HTLC of two Bitcoin, Alice is going to tell Bob, I, I'm sending you two Bitcoin, but I want you to forward them to Carol. And usually, Alice is going to add a small fee to Bob so that Bob has an incentive to route that payment. And it's the exact same mechanism where until Carol has not released the pre-image of the hash that was in the payment request, no one can really spend the funds. And when Carol reveals it to Bob, Bob has to forward it to Alice or spend it. But if he spends it, he spends it on the Bitcoin blockchain and Alice can see that value on the blockchain. So it's essentially the same. So it works exactly the same. It works exactly the same. And the reason it's secure is because there's, we adjust timeouts, basically. We adjust the timeouts so that if someone on the right tries to cheat, you have time to detect it and to steal back his funds because you're, you have to always be watching the Bitcoin blockchain to detect that someone is trying to cheat by broadcasting a transaction to the Bitcoin blockchain. But you can detect it and we adjust the timeouts when we are doing payments with multiple hops to allow you to have enough time to detect that someone is trying to cheat you and get your money back. So basically, the idea is that you are able to pay anyone, but you have to be able to find a route to those people. Because if you want to pay someone you're not connected to, you need to find multiple hops and multiple channels that allow you to route that payment to the end uh, recipient. So in the way we route currently in the Lightning Network is that we use source routing with onion routing. It's not in the spec per se, but we agreed to use that routing algorithm, but you can route however you want, and we're probably going to be upgrading the routing al algorithm, and I'm working on a proposal to change it a bit. The way it works is basically like Tor, where we do onion encryption, because we don't want, when you want to send a payment through multiple hops, you obviously don't want those people to learn who you are, who you're paying to. So what we do is that the sender is going to be choosing the whole route. Do I have a slide? Yeah. So for example, here, if the sender on, on, on the left chooses a route that includes four intermediate hops before the destination, 
And then that sender is going to start encrypting the payment for the final destination, then encrypting that for the next to last hop, then re-encrypting that for the next to next to last hop, all the way so that it's a layered encryption uh, just like in Tor. It looks like uh, an onion where the middle is encrypted for the, the middle is encrypted for the last node and then you have layers for each of the nodes in the route. And when, when an intermediate node receives a packet, he, he is able to just decrypt one layer and that layer just tells him forward that to that next guy and forward this amount of money. So he only knows, he only learns the previous guy and the next guy. And we'll see a bit, in a bit more detail how that works exactly. So it's based on a research paper called Sphinx that was published in 29 by uh, Microsoft and uh, the University of Waterloo. It's detailed in uh, one of our balls. I'll explain later what that is. And it uses a 1,300 byte fixed size packet because you, you need to have a packet that's fixed size to prevent people who watch the network from correlating your payments. And we use a construction that called a, that's called a deterministic filler that prevents anyone in the payment path from even knowing how many people are in the payment and where they are in the path. People can't know if they are the first guy, the third guy, or the, 19, uh, the 19th guy. And we also, had, we also had a MAC, a message authentication code, to every payload, which means that if someone tries to cheat by flipping a bit in one of the payloads, the next guy is gonna catch that the previous guy has cheated and can cancel the payment. And that's important because that's an issue Tor has. Tor has an issue where you can tag people by just, you can figure out if you, ha if you have two nodes in Tor, you can figure out if those two nodes are in the same circuit by just flipping a bit at the first node. And since there are no Macs in Tor, the other guys will just relay it and when you receive it on your second node, if you flip the same bit and it's, it decrypts properly, you know that you, you are in the same route. And that means you, you are able to untag your users. And Tor is trying to fix that, but they don't have the right solution yet. However, we do have a small issue with uh, correlating payments, is that if you look closely here, this R value is the same for everyone in the route, so in fact, everyone is able to correlate, uh, to co correlate the payment right, right now. But that's something we know how to fix, where we're gonna replace that uh, mechanism based on hashes by mechanism based on uh, elliptic curve points, where instead it's gonna be a, a curve point blinded at each hop, so you won't be able to correlate it between different hops. So that's the gory slides where we do crypto. So basically the way it works is that the sender on the left is going Alice is going to choose to make a payment to Dave by going through Bob and Carol. Alice is going to generate an ephemeral public key called the session key which is here K1 K and uh, EK1 and from that she's going to derive a public point, a shared secret and uh, a blinding factor. And I put colors to show you what each node knows. And basically, Bob only knows the things that are in pink. Carol only knows the things that are in brown. And Dave only knows the things that are in green. And they are not able to derive anything else. And that's what protects the scheme. The way it works is that we start by creating, putting the plain text for Dave at the beginning of uh, 1,300 uh, bytes. We then put an empty HMAC with only zeros. We create a pseudo-random stream of bytes using a key that Dave will be able to derive as well from the session key. We XOR that with the plain text, so we end up with something that's, uh, that's encrypted for Dave. We have a ciphertext for Dave, and then we're gonna shift it to the right insert, put a HMAC of everything that's here. We, yeah, we had, we had a, an HMAC of the whole packet and a public session key on the left side. Then we're gonna shift to the right. The HMAC that was here, we're gonna put it here for Carol, and we're gonna put a plain text for Carol. 
Then we're going to XOR with uh, Shasha 20 uh, made with a factor that Carol is able to derive. And then we're going to do exactly the same. I didn't have enough space on the slide to do the last hop where we do exactly the same for Bob. But the idea is that basically you just put the payload, encrypt it, shift it, put the payload for the next guy, encrypt it, shift it, and you keep on shifting. And that means that you can use potentially all the bytes and in our construction that allows us to use at most 20 hops in the route, which is a very big anonymity set with uh, the number of nodes that we have in the routing network. And once someone receives such a message, for example, Bob receives something that looks like this, that has uh, an HMAC at the end, a ciphertext that he's going to be able to decrypt and things that are encrypted uh, on the other side. He first checks, he's able to derive the key for the HMAC. He checks the HMAC to verify that no one changed the packet in flight. Then, he's, since he's also able to derive the, uh, from a shared secret the key that, were, that was used for the encryption, he's able to redo the XOR and decrypt the plain text. In that plain text, he finds the information that says the next guy is Carol, here is her public key, here is the amount you need to, you need to forward. And he can just shift it to the left to remove the plain text that was for him, and he ends up with a message for Carol. And that repeats until it reaches the end. Yes? Yeah? It's because it's just because uh, this is the ASCII uh, code for row, the Greek letter that's on the left, and same for mu. It's just the ASCII code of. Uh, in fact, we use it as key, but we use the shared secret as data. It's a way to derive keys from a shared secret and a fixed uh, key identifier. In fact, that first thing that you see the row is a key identifier. And since there's the shared secret that we use as plain text, it derives a unique key. Yes, you are always going to use this key. Yeah, but with a different plain text. So it, it's, a, it's another payload. You, you just care about getting a payload that's random. And that's what we use. Since we use HMAC, it's uh, randomly distributed. So it's, we only want to get a a good uh, distribution of uh, output between the 32 bytes. So th th that's a construction that has been proven uh, secure in the Sphinx paper. Yeah, for, for the amount, there's another way of, yeah, for the amount you can see, in fact, the amount is not going to be the same because you, you're putting fees at each hop and it's decreasing a bit. So if you want to game that, you can, uh, you can play on that. But if you, are, if you have two nodes in the route and you don't know how many nodes are in between, you can't correlate them because the difference in the amount depends on how many nodes are in between and you don't know that. So you can't know that you are, uh, if you didn't know the same, uh, that it's the same hash, you can't know that you're in the same route because you receive an amount that's different and it would have different depending on the number that, of nodes that are in between. So if you receive enough payments, it's just the same. It's hidden among many payments. But the thing that makes, you, that makes it very easy to correlate though is that it's the same hash currently that's used for all hops. So you can really just decorrelate it very easily. But if we move to keys that are blinded at, e at each hop, which we want to do, then you can't do that anymore. Yes? Who's going to pay for the script that's going to check in every uh, mile of the chain yeah. has the enough balance to carry on? You, yeah, you, you check it before forwarding. If you, if you receive it, you know if it's valid or not, depending on uh, whether you can forward it with a channel that has enough balance or not. And if you can't, you just uh, respond that you, you, you're just failing the payment and it's going to go back to the sender and it's going to try another route. Okay, but you, you, you spent uh, some... No, 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 you, you didn't spend anything because you just exchanged uh, signed transactions, but you're not broadcasting them on Bitcoin, so it's not spent yet. It's only spent 
if you broadcast that transaction on Bitcoin. And if you do, since you sent a revocation for, for your previous transaction, if you do before it's set, Yeah, but the, in fact, those fees are promised. It's, uh, it's, it, they are added in the payment channel, but since it's not committed to Bitcoin yet, it's, they are promised if the payment succeeds. If the payment uh, doesn't succeed, then uh, you lose the fees. So that's why everyone has an incentive to make the payment succeed, because that's how you get the fees that were promised to you. But then what prevents you from spamming the network? Spamming how? Because wh when you're sending a transaction, you are changing the balance in your payment channel. For example, if I, if I send a transaction of two Bitcoin, I have a payment channel with four Bitcoin on my side and two on the other. I'm sending the transaction, the balance is going to be two, two, until the payment either succeeds or fails. So I, I can only spam what I have. I, if I have 10 Bitcoin, I can only spam an amount of 10 Bitcoin. Uh, I cannot just uh, send a transaction of, one, of 10 Bitcoin and another one because it's already locked in one payment. Um, how high are the fees? Are the fees very high? Because if it goes through like multiple points, then... Yeah, it, it, the fees are... In fact, each node chooses their fee. You advertise your fees to the network, and that's what helps the sender decide how he's going to route, depending on, on if he wants many, no, many hubs for anonymity or not many hubs for better fees. Currently, a lot of nodes offer zero fee just to let the network, uh, let people use the network. But the idea is that at some point, since you advertise your fees to the whole network, you have an incentive to advertise fees that match what the others do, so there's going to be an equilibrium that will be met. The idea is that you should put fees that en enable you to pay for your expense on uh, infrastructure and hardware, but you won't be able to make a lot of money with fees because otherwise there are, there are going to be people who are more competitive than you. So. And when you want to make a payment, that's a choice. You choose either to put many fees because you want to do many hops and be hidden in a bigger anonymity set, or if you only care about efficiency, the incentive is to just use one or, one or two hops. Okay, but it's still very cheap compared to later. Yeah, yeah the, the, the fees are, I think that people, th there was a data analysis on the fees currently on the Lightning Network, and I think it was a, a few Satoshis. So really cheap. And if you use only big nodes that are already well connected and use zero fees, it's going to be zero. So, all right. So now, a bit of history of the Lightning Network. How it started? It started in 2013 with uh, between 2013 and 2015 with uh, research papers. Just finding the idea and explaining the idea of payment channels, of creating uh, off-chain off payment channels between participants to be able to scale uh, blockchains like Bitcoins, mainly Joseph Poon and uh, Touch Traja. Then, but when they released the paper, it was an academic effort, but they didn't want to implement it because they were researchers and they said it's open. Uh, anyone who wants to implement it, just take it and implement it. And that's where Rusty Russell, uh, a Linux uh, kernel developer, created another paper which was more geared towards uh, developers on how we could make that thing real because the research paper had a lot of gaps, uh, didn't mention rounding, didn't mention fees at all. So Rusty Russell did a lot of work to, to prove that it was doable. And then mainly three, uh, three companies were created or decided to take on the project. I think the one I'm working with in Paris, uh, Lightning Labs in San Francisco and Blockstream. And they met together in Milan in 2016 to, or even before, no, yeah, in 2016, to decide on a, an initial spec and then to implement it. And it reached mainnet in, uh, in 2017 with uh, Litecoin. Yeah, and 2017, in, it reached mainnet and now we are on mainnet. We have been for a while and uh, I have more stats at the end. The, the, way, the way it works is that it's just like Bitcoin, it's fully open source, everything is open. Our RFC is just a repo on GitHub that anyone can come and comment on and uh, commit on. We have IRC meetings every two Mondays. This is open as well. It's on the Lightning uh, Dev uh, channel on Freenode. Anyone can join and the logs are public as well so you can see what has been said in all the previous meetings, all the decisions that were made. There's nothing happening in, uh, in private. Everything is either on GitHub on, uh, or on IRC in public channels. 
it's split in uh, different bolts, basis of lightning uh, technologies that are different parts of, uh, of a protocol, basically. For example, bolt four is about the onion routing of the cryptography. Seven is about peer-to-peer -peer routing and uh, gossip messages. And you can find all that on GitHub. The, the idea, we want to have many different implementations but that work together. And currently the three main ones are C Lightning in C by Blockstream, Eclair hours in Scala, LND in Go by uh, Lightning Labs in San Francisco. And there's a Japanese team uh, that joined the project uh, and I think they're close to, they released on mainnet and they are compatible with uh, the three others called Tamigan. And there's also Matt Corallo, a Bitcoin core developer who has been doing a lot of work on a Rust implementation, but more as a library than a full node. There's Lit, uh, which is, uh, I'm not sure it's Python, I thought it was Go. And there's Electrum, who's trying to do an implementation of a uh, full implementation of, of Lightning in Python. And since all the implementations are fully open source, there's also a repo that does integration tests between all those implementations. Anyone is free to start their own implementation. But honestly, it's a lot of work and it's, a lot, it's, it's hard to get it right. So just join another, another project if you want to, to really help. And some stats about the network itself. I think it was a month ago that I pulled those uh, numbers. It's uh, 5,000 nodes. Oh no, it's a lot more than that. Yeah, it's that. So it's, uh, now I think it's uh, 9,000 nodes that are publicly running. And that's only the public part because private, we also have um, an Android app called Declare Mobile. And when you run it, you are basically a full lightning node but you, have, you are opening by default private channels because you don't want people to route through you because you're just a phone, so you're not going to be online all the time, so it's going to be hard to be routing payments. But you have, that means you have a lot of channels, so it's a lot more than the free 34,000 channels that are publicly available on the network. And there are, I think that now there are a bit more Bitcoins than that. I think we reach more than 1,000 Bitcoin, which is more than $11 million. So it's starting to be quite a lot of money uh, on the network, so it shows that it's stable. And nodes are getting older and older. At the, at the beginning, it was mainly people trying to run it on Raspberry Pis just for fun and then uh, forgetting that they had a node somewhere. So it was uh, nodes were coming and going. But now people who are routing are more stable, have better infrastructure, and nodes are becoming older and uh, running without, uh, without any issues. And channels are getting uh, stay open uh, for a long time because the idea is that once you have created your channel and paid fees to, for one Bitcoin transaction to create that channel, in fact, there's no reason to ever close it. You can keep on, since with that channel, you can do multi-hop payments to pay to anyone. You can just keep it alive as long as you want. And that's the goal because that's the, less, the least expensive for you is to keep it open and not have to do a transaction on chain because here the fees are going to be much lower than on the Bitcoin blockchain. So you can do everything on Lightning. And we're working on, uh, we're adding atomic swaps between uh, Bitcoin and Lightning to allow you to refill your channels in a trustless way without, yeah, you have to do a Bitcoin transaction obviously for an, an atomic swap, but with a, a cost that's not, too, that's not too high. So now if you have any question, of if you want to follow all the GitHub repositories are public, we have uh, an async uh, Twitter handle where we tweet about news. Uh, I have one where I don't tweet that much at all. And there's, the, there's our GitHub repo where you can track uh, all the activity. So if you have any questions, yeah. Uh, I have a question about uh, when a new user wants to deposit funds mm -hmm. Oh, like, uh, you, yeah, you, you mean uh, when you're doing payments, you have to stay online to make sure people do not uh, steal your funds, right? No, for example, if I want to deposit one Bitcoin, yeah. you have to, uh, there is a portion of your funds that are held. Ah, the reserve? Are, yes, yeah. the reserve. Uh, is that reserve is calculated by the wallet? And how is it calculated? No, is it related to the mining, current mining fees? No. Or uh, is it uh, set by the user who deposits the funds? It's, you, you can't set it. I think it's uh, the spec decides how it's calculated. That reserve is here in order to align incentives because if, if 
the channel is completely depleted on one side, meaning that uh, someone has all the farms in the channel. The other guy has a complete incentive to try to cheat because he can't lose more because there's already zero on his side. So he has an incentive to broadcast an old uh, version of the state anytime he sees that, for example, you're not online. And that's not very good for the stability of the uh, channel. So that's why we added that reserve so that ed everyone always has an incentive to lose something if they try to cheat. But that's something that's mainly needed because of the way we do penalty transactions now. When we move to L2, which was mentioned, where we can instead correct the state if you're tra trying to cheat, maybe we can get rid of that reserve entirely or at least lower it. But th there's still going to be something. Th there's an issue with the dust limit, where in Bitcoin, if you try to do transactions that's very, very low, it's going to be so low that it's not economically viable for the miner to include it, so it's never going to be included. That's what we call the dust limit. And transactions that are below the dust can never be claimed on chain because no miner will include them in a block. So it's the same in Lightning. We allow you to make payments that are milli satoshis, but in reality, if you only do payments with milli satoshis, you will never be able to reclaim them on chain because that's not enough bitcoins for for a transaction. So there's always going to be a lower threshold where if you have way too much money, it's, uh, the miners won't accept it on chain, so you will somehow lose it if you try to broadcast it uh, at that moment. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I don't think we plan on putting any more state because if we only want to do payments, we don't need more states. But what we, we can we can put a lot of data in there, and uh, there are uh, there's a way when you when you're basically making payments, for example, data that's encrypted, people are already using that to put some data in the payment that allows you to decrypt the thing that you're buying. So you can do a lot of uh, funny things with that because in Bitcoin scripts you can add a lot of data in fact and in, in the invoice that I showed here, since you, the way you do payment is by just providing a QR code that someone is going to scan, you can put more data in there. But I don't think, I don't see a use case of putting a lot of state because we're not doing, a, we're not a smart contract uh, blockchain since Bitcoin is only a payment blockchain. That was kind of my question, like, is it, uh, are there some ideas of trying to bring more business logic into this? But with, with Bitcoin Script, you, you can already do, in fact, a lot of business logic. It's just, it's, it's harder right. to, the, to develop it, but you can, you can use Bitcoin Script to do a lot of things. But the idea is that Bitcoin is going to stay a blockchain for payments. That's the main uh, yeah. reason for Bitcoin. So that. There aren't that many use cases that require a lot of state added to what's already existing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You presented the Sphinx uh, on mm -hmm. your routing. Uh, I'm not really sure to understand. Is it what is currently implemented? And if not, yeah. what is the difference? It is what's implemented. It's a. Uh, we have a sm small variations from what's in the research paper, but it's basically, uh, it's basically the same. It's, uh, we read the research paper, we adapted a few things, but uh, it's exactly the Sphinx construction. And if anyone else, I'm gonna hand it over to Youssef, and we're on time for the second talk. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>